and welcome to Straight Talk, Supply Chain Insights, the podcast for your supply chain leader who is on the go and wants to be in the know. And now, your host, Laura Ciceri. Welcome to Straight Talk with Supply Chain Insights. This podcast series is designed for the supply chain leader that's on the go, but wants to be in the know. And I find most supply chain leaders are on the go today, you know, with global organizations and a lot of activity happening that we find ourselves often in airplane seats and moving in cars. And this podcast is to make the research more digestible. So my name is Laura Ciceri, and I have a research company. It's an analyst company. It's a small company. It's designed for insights for business leaders. And I follow the evolution of technology and the maturity of processes and give advice to companies. So when I write on my blog, it's never pay for play. And it is usually a little bit edgy, a little controversial, and it's designed that way. So in 2019, I did some research on SNOP. And when we compare the current effectiveness of sales and operations planning with today, we have slipped considerably. 30% of companies rate their SNOP processes less effective today than they did three years ago. So you might say why, and that's what I said. Why, 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 why? And I started interviewing companies and I started looking at technologies And today in this podcast, I want to share my insights on a research project that I did in 2019. I started with the data from the research study, and the research study was based upon respondents that I sourced through my LinkedIn community of 316,000 people, and I had 107 business leaders that responded to the survey. And we looked at how do we define supply chain effectiveness when it comes to sales and operations planning and how effective are today's processes? And those are deep topics of what is effective, right? So I rank effective supply chains as those that have the ability to have the same cost quality and customer service irrespective of demand and supply variability. And demand and supply variability are increasing And the supply chain is becoming more intertwined and global, and we have more corporate pressures, whether it's corporate sustainability, greenhouse gases, plastic, or whether it's, um, you know, the movement of material scarcity and the need to use materials that are a lower standard or the lack of availability of transportation or the need to move data more quickly. We're no, not short on challenges, but let's face, let's focus on basics, right? Why is the SNOP process seen as less effective three-year span, and what can we learn? Well, one of the things that I think is a big gap is a focus on basics, right? Sales and operations planning should report to a profit center leader it should be balanced. The S should be balanced with the OP and the focus needs to be on the ampersand. It needs strong what if capabilities and it needs the ability to work cross functionally to be able to implement a successful value chain strategy to implement a strategy. Business strategies are often not clear and the uh, SNOP process will often not report to the organization that can make profit center decisions. In addition, because many organizations have become very focused on shiny objects, they're focusing on short-term results and sales and operations planning is really a process to look at the tactical horizon, which is the period from 10 to 12 weeks or whatever the slush period is when you're forming up orders to the tactical horizon where you manage constraints. So you're making asset decisions or you're making buying decisions. And the goal is to have a feasible plan to be able to look at how can you manage source, make, and deliver together to actualize a business strategy. Well, there's a lot there, right? What is the business strategy and what is an effective supply chain and how do I align source, make, and deliver to do that? 
Anybody that's in supply chain knows that those are not easy things to accomplish. It requires a lot of discipline. It requires looking at what are the lead times? How do I manage the time cycles? How do I introduce buffers? Where is my push-pull decoupling points? And the design of the supply chain to be able to do that is really essential. Now, one of the things we find in today's companies is that many of the technologies are being implemented to basically orchestrate the SNOP meeting, which I call above the line, but below the line, getting ready for the meeting, uh, orchestrating the output of the meeting, which I call below the line, many companies are really struggling with the implementation of their planning technologies. Many companies have implemented the technology, turned it on, but not tested if they're getting better answers. So, you know, they're not necessarily lifting the demand plan, which is better than the naive forecast or three months of shipments, you know, and We've invested millions of dollars and we've got lots of salaries, but yet we're not giving a better demand signal than if we took the average of three months of shipments. Many people are not able to answer the question, are you getting a better answer out of your planning system for inventory and inventory mix than if you hadn't deployed it? And, you know, looking at the math and, you know, doing the analysis of mix optimization and inventory should be a goal of everyone to just look at the outputs from the system, use some simple measures to say, is my system giving me a better output? Wow, you might say, well, isn't that easy? Got to tell you, and most companies I go in and I work with, they've implemented the technology to get the technology live, but not driven process improvement and better decisions and not help the organization to be able to use the input for better output. Now, those are some of the basics. So we start with, let's focus on the basics. But in addition, I think the SNOP process has been degraded by fads. The supply chain team loves shiny objects, loves new processes, and we go through wave after wave of supposed process improvement that really doesn't go very far. So do you remember CPFR and VMI that we were going to take customer data and we were going to build outside end processes? Well. You know, the issue with CPFR was that most customers' forecasts are not very good and not a good signal to tie your red wagon to. And on VMI, we have a lot of vendor-managed inventory processes that don't really connect to demand plans. They connect to order management. And so that we went through that whole process. Some companies implemented SNOP with their customers, but they got into that kind of quicksand of, what is a customer forecast and what do I do if the customer's forecast is not a good signal? Then we had the whole wave of, if I want to know what we're going to sell, I'm just going to ask sales, right? You know, sales should know. They're out in the field. But every salesperson only knows the region where they work. And so they work in a small microscope of the market. A salesperson's feedback is not the same as the market. But also, if you want the highest bias and error, you're going to ask sales because by definition, the sales organization is coin operated. I love sales, but they're based upon bonus incentives. They are going to basically taint the information on collaborative sales forecasting based upon the incentives. And so the efforts we had around collaborative sales forecasting actually took most of the demand plans backwards, not forwards, in the companies that I worked with. Now, we also went from regional to global supply chains, and that introduced three complexities that I think most companies didn't really buckle up and tackle. The first was we had more systems and more process differences as we went global, and we really did not assimilate that very well. We didn't look at how do we align metrics, how do we align data, and we really let those processes sort of run, but we didn't drive global process improvement. The second thing is we didn't define regional, global, divisional governance very well. 
What is the regional team responsible for? What is the divisional team responsible for? What is the global team? What does supply chain excellence look like? And many times people made supply chain centers of excellence, but they didn't define excellence. And so we got all tangled up with who's got the ball and how do we make a decision and what does good look like? And in that vacuum, we really struggled. And I think companies that did a better job of saying, you know, this is the discipline we need. This is how we're going to run up regional to divisional to global did a lot better. So I'll tell you a story. In 2004, I ran into a man by the name of Dick Clark. At that point in time, worked for Procter & Gamble, loved Dick. Dick died of brain cancer, unfortunately. But, you know, I was an analyst at a company called AMR Research, which got bought by Gartner and is no more. And, you know, I used to laugh with Dick because I had a lot of respect for him. And I was one of the people that would often help me with my research studies and research panel and just great wisdom. And Rick and, you know, Dick spent, you know, two to three years working around the world on how do we take input from the divisions and the regions within P&G and operate a matrix environment to roll up to a global demand plan? And I was pretty naive. I said to Dick, why is it so hard? Why are you spending two to three years defining how do you get input and really roll up the input to be able to drive better outcomes? And he said, Laura, you know, you analyst types make it too easy, right? We've got all these divisions. We've got people around the world that aren't at the same level of demand planning. We've got different technologies and we've got executive expectations and bonuses to manage. He says, it's as much political as it is data. And so over the two to three years that I worked with Dick in that period of time, I came to really appreciate why we need regional global governance. I'll tell you another story. I worked with a very large uh, manufacturing company that hired a consulting company who specialized in SNOP, and they let the divisions define each of their SNOP processes. The problem was when they got all done, they couldn't roll up the forecasts from division to division because they didn't work on the same calendar. Some of those divisions did weekly, and they ended their months at different periods, and some did quarterly, and some did monthly. And it was just a mesh of, you know, timing and cadence that just couldn't be rolled up. So whatever we're going to do in governance, we've got to get really clear on calendars, really clear on roles and responsibilities, and we've got to align it with metrics. Most companies have not done that. And most companies struggle because the term forecast means really different things. The only thing common between a sales forecast, a financial forecast, and a supply chain forecast is the word forecast. So the naive person says, I'm going to have one forecast, right? And I say, which part of this forecast is the one? Because the forecast is a hierarchy with a lot of numbers. And, you know, the sales team will forecast at a customer national level, which is too high of a level for the supply chain. The financial team will forecast in dollars at a high level, but the supply chain team needs a forecast in an item location at a granular level and needs to have a very tight discipline to run, you know, the mothership we call supply chain. So we got lost in that kind of, you know, maze of information and changes without really a lot of logic. The second thing that happened uh, after the movement of regional global supply chains, as we're talking about fads, is this kind of new wave of we're not going to do SNOP, we're going to do IBP. Okay, well, every client I go to has a different term for SNOP, and I really don't care what people call it, right? I just want to be able to have a cross-functional process to maximize opportunity and mitigate risk and to have a feasible plan. And the concept of IBP was that, you know, we've only been focused on volume, we need to focus on currency, and we need to focus on balance sheet impacts. Okay, I get that. And in most, you know, mature SNOP processes, that was happening anyway, but it was only 5% of companies. 
However, when we got kind of this IBP fad, we started moving away from supply chain basics towards dollar level outputs. And we forgot we needed a feasible plan and we needed to do what if analysis to be able to align manufacturing load. And we needed to look at cycles and we needed to look at buffers. We fought, forgot about a lot of the supply chain basics. So the IBP work actually took us backwards, not forwards. In addition, you know, we've got a lot of challenges, right? We can't get to data. We've got issues with executive team understanding of supply chain as a complex nonlinear system. And we didn't bring that forward a lot. So, you know, only one third of companies have SNOP technologies that allow what if capabilities. And many people think that they have one supply chain. They don't recognize that they have many and they don't know how to type it. So is it any wonder we've gone backwards? And one of the things that I'm trying to do in my writing and my work right now is to help companies move forward on SNOP and on planning and look at how can we get engines and rules and policies to align and how can we design buffers and cycles to be able to drive supply chain effectiveness. So this is Laura. I'm deep into the research. Look for the writing and hopefully you'll consider joining us at our summit where we talk about these and other topics. It'll be in September 2020 and it'll be in Franklin, Tennessee. And I hope to see you there. Our focus is on supply chain 2030 and what can we learn from the past decade to get ready. Until next time, bye now. Mm-hmm.